today taking a look, another look at David. We've been looking at royalty. And Moses gave the warning long time ago that you will know you have a good king when they do not pursue the collection of horses, when they do not pursue the collection of wives, when they do not pursue the collection of gold and the collection of silver. Those are kind of interesting criteria. And on the positive side, you will know you have a good king when they reflect God's glory. But beware of the horses, the wives, gold and silver. And when David is introduced to us, he's introduced as a young shepherd. And as soon as they give his father's name, we know that his heritage can be found in the book of Ruth. So we know a little bit, and then we have this shepherd boy. And then we have the prophet Samuel comes. And the prophet comes to the household of Jesse with all of his sons and is looking for one that God said, you will know when you see him. And he goes through all the sons and nothing. So he asks the father, is there any more children that you have? And he says, yes, we have the young one who is watching the sheep. And that is David. They bring in David, and Samuel the prophet anoints him. Anoints him for something special, even though it doesn't say what the speciality is. But at the same time, everyone knows that there is a problem with the king. Shortly thereafter, David's father asks him to take lunch to his brothers. And when he does that, his brothers are on the battlefield. That's the story of David and Goliath. And we know David as a young man who is very good with the slingshot. He protects the sheep. With that, he keeps the animals, the wild animals at bay. And he looks at Goliath as just one more beast who is messing with the lamb. And we have the story of David and Goliath. We then know that David can also sing. And he plays the harp. And every time the king gets depressed, I don't think they had too much medicine in those days for depression, but we all know that music is really a good thing. When the king gets depressed, they bring David in to sing and to play music for the king. David then becomes a warrior. He has one of the king's armies. And David's popularity grows and grows and grows as the king shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And the king is determined to kill David. And there are many occasions in that process where David has the ability, the time, the opportunity to kill the king, but he doesn't want to hurt God's anointing. He is a man of character. He is a man of principle. He is a man of courage. He is a man of musical skills. He is a quality, quality fellow. And I can't underscore that enough. In addition to that, he is philosophically bent, and he's artistic in his writing. And you know, you, we all get to an age where we realize that between birth and death, where we live, Somewhere in there, we say to ourselves, what is this all about? Life is short. The psalmist says it's like a flower. 
it kind of grows rather quickly, and then the petals start to fall off and we die. What is the meaning of all of that? I don't know how you would answer that question. Let me share with you how David answers that question. We all draw on our own experiences in life. David says it this way. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You have all heard that before. But that's his story and how he would summarize his life. My first point is this. He is a Quality, quality man. And it's important that you understand that. Now, a little transition. You all heard the story of King David and the chicken farmer? Oh. David decides to put a road for his <coughs> army to go through but the problem is it cuts across the farmer's land. And it happens to be that part of the farmer's land where he has chickens. And King David says, don't worry about it. And the farmer is really upset. It's going to hurt my chickens. The king says, if you have any problems, just call the sheriff and we'll correct the problem. So they open up the road and the first day a chariot comes roaring through that road and kills several of the farmer's chickens. He's on the phone calling. He's just screaming at the sheriff, do something about it. Nothing happens. Next day, same thing. More chickens get killed. They come over, and the sheriff probably puts up a speed limit sign. More chickens get killed. This goes on for two weeks. The poor farmer, he's got all these dead chickens around and chariots running up and down this road. He's having a fit. And all of a sudden, the phone call to the sheriff stops. First day, the sheriff says to himself, I wonder if everything's all right. Why didn't the chicken farmer call me? The next day, the same thing. The next day, by the fourth day, the sheriff saying to himself, you know, I wonder if the chicken farmer's still alive. So the beginning of the next week, he goes out there to inspect what is happening and how come the chicken farmer stopped calling comes up to the road, he notices a chariot in front of him that slows down. And the chariot just kind of slowly paces down the road past the chickens. And then he noticed that the farmer had put up a big sign. Do you know what that sign said? <laughs> Nudist colony ahead. Watch <laughs> out for chicks. <laughs> Why did I tell you that? <laughs> There's a reason for it. I just lost my point. <laughs> he 
Here's the reason for it. <laughs> Good David has trouble sleeping one night. Wakes up in the middle of the night, goes up to his roof, and lo and behold, there's a good-looking lady taking a bath. And he says to himself, Squire, you can help me, guys. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> the rest of you gentlemen, he says to himself, Ooh! However you want to say it, you got the picture. Right? Got to be careful of who's. And then, because the king has servants, he does what he has done before. He did this when he was wondering whether his good friend Jonathan had any members left. He sent a servant to put out a report. Go scout it out. So he says to the servant, Go find out who that young lady is. And the servant comes back and says, That's Uriah's wife, the soldier. And he's presently with the army. He's not going to be home for quite a while. And then David takes two servants and says, Go get her. Now that's different. You know, that's not quite a date. I don't know what you call that. But I don't know how many of your experiences you've been able to say to your servants, go get her and bring her to me. It doesn't quite work that way. But that's the way that it worked for David. Go get her. So they bring her to David's palace. And a verse or two later, she sends a message back that says, uh-oh. Now, can you women help me out here? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, I'm pregnant. And what follows that is Blankety blank, now what? And that's kind of one of the motifs of human life. It quickly goes from ooh to uh oh to now what? How does a quality, quality man? handle this situation? Well, one, he has authority. And what he does with authority is he sends a messenger to the head of his army and said, send this soldier back home. And he knows that if the soldier comes back home, and this woman, the, the wife, usually when she has her baby, they can claim that it's the husband's. Or at least that's his hope. So he comes home. David is happy. But he learns the next day that he came back to town, but he didn't stay in his own home. He slept with the guards at the gate. And David, this quality man, inquired. He says, how come you didn't go home? And the soldier says, my boss, the head of your army, and all his men, they're all sleeping outside in the field, fighting a war. It wouldn't be honorable for me to go to my home when all of my comrades are out there sleeping in the cold.
And David says, I think you ought to spend another day here. And tonight, why don't you take off your boots, have your feet washed, make yourself comfortable in your own home. And that night, they discover that he did not do that, but rather he slept at the palace with the palace guards so that he could keep his honor. So then David doesn't know what to do. You ever been in a situation where you've, what do you do when you don't know what to do? He gives Uriah a note to take back to his boss, the head of the army, goes back to the boss, and the note says, put Uriah in the front of the line where the battle is the fiercest, and when it really gets fierce, back off the rest of the army so that Uriah gets killed. And you say to yourselves, how can such a quality man do such a thing? I mean, that's pretty low stuff. David's argument is, hey, it's war. People get killed all the time. He's just one more. And you say, where, what happened to this quality fellow? And the worst part about it is, he is blind. He suffers from entitlement. Now, sometimes we think of people claiming entitlement. It's always referred to the poor. This is the rich and powerful. I'm king. Whatever the king does is good, is it not? So he marries her. Why do I tell you that? <coughs> we are all in danger of being blind to our own actions. That's one reason. The second reason is most everyone has been severely hurt by someone you thought was a good person who did something really stupid. Stupid may not be the right word for it. Harmful. We have a tendency to burn other people and to be burned by them. If King David and all of his quality can allow him to do something like that. What does this say about us? I would hate to think that I could do that. I hate to think that you could do that. I'd hate to think that David could do that. David is quality fellow and this seems so out of character but that's one of the descriptions of human nature 
that we carry with us not necessarily two layers, but for many it looks more like a marble cake than a personality is a strange thing. None of us have the control over it that we think we do. There's more to the story, but that's for next week. Same time, same station. I hope you'll be here. For those of you who are going back, if you're heading back north this week, when you're finished shoveling all the snow, I think you can probably get the next story on the, our church's uh, website. Next week's sermon is about David and the story. You know I like stories. Coming from next week. Let, let us pray. Father, we're a mixed bag. We endeavor to be strong and courageous and honest and upright. And holy. We endeavor to be good servants. But we'd ask that you would allow us to avoid the cockiness. Help us not to judge others so strongly. Help us to walk in your forgiveness and help us to forgive others. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.